Salit for organising this and thank you all for, for turning up. It's, um, it's my first trip to Israel and it's, it's very different, very different conservation issues than what we face in Australia, so I'm already learning a lot about what goes on here. Um, that was one of my titles. In fact, I woke up at 4am uh, this morning and decided to rewrite my entire talk, so there'll be typos all the way through it because I decided everything I had thought about as, and I was going to talk about was, was, was not appropriate or not well suited to what I needed to say today. Um, the other version of my talk in the program, it says, does science change government policy and management? And so uh, at the moment, uh, I'll give three examples about how I feel as though we have changed science, uh, uh, policy and management uh, on fairly large issues in Australia. Three good examples of what a relative success is in fact. Uh, and we've got out, real outputs in terms of conservation outputs, not necessarily outcomes in terms of conservation outcomes. So you might be thinking at the end of this that the take home message is that science does have a big impact. However, in some senses, it's not the science that's having the impact. Uh, and what I'll try and end up with, it's, it's, it's all the things other than the science that's having the impact. Being a scientist sometimes helps. And uh, in the end, I'll talk about uh, my approach to actually getting things done, which is certainly not politically correct uh, and is not down in the handbooks. And we, it might be something that we need to discuss about really the human inter interactions between all these different organisations, the government, the NGOs, the scientists, and how do you actually get things to happen, uh, which, is, which is usually uh, as I often say to my lab, is just flirt. Flirt with anybody. That's the key. I don't know if there's a good Hebrew translation for flirting, but it's sort of a non-sexual flirting, basic. You know, be nice to people. See what you can get out of them. And that's how to get anything done. And I suppose that's it, really. That's the take-home message. You can go to sleep for the rest of the talk. Um, I have a very large group of people that I work with um, and uh, that's just about half of them. So I, I'm like all good and successful professors, I try and do as little as possible and exploit the minds of the youth. So that's my task. They, they are the exploited minds. They do all the work and then I just stick my names on the papers and I go to the meetings and get bored and uh, come back with some ideas. That's how we work. And so uh, I'd just like to point out there's a big group of people behind everything I'm going to talk about today and a big group of people uh, working continuously, particularly on the kind of stuff that Tom talked about near the end, which is all about putting cost into conservation decision making. So the, the broad theme of my research group, and I'll tell you how I got to that point, was from about 1994. I, sub, I sort of woke up one day and decided that conservation biology has too much biology and too many biologists and they needed some decision scientists, they need some economists and some engineers and some applied mathematicians who are the people involved in making decisions. And uh, that's what I've been doing for 15 years, is just stealing 50-year-old tools from economics and applied maths and bringing them in to conservation. That's basically it. I'm going to start with some stories and the first story I'm going to start off with is the story that drew me to that conclusion because it started around about 1992-1993 and I'm gonna, it's, it's a very long story, I'm going to make it quite short. Um, but this is the first case where I'd been involved as a activist in the conservation movement. This is the first case when I was a, a young lecturer involved in, with government, trying to make a decision about a threatened species. So the little possum up there on the top right is Leadbeater's possum. And effectively, uh, this is work I did over a long period of time, three years, four years with David Lindenmeyer. We continued to work together. David Lindenmeyer spent a lot of his PhD working on Leadbeater's possum. And in the 90s, there were enormous disputes in Australia about forestry management. They were, that was the big green issue, the big environmental issue in the entire country, or well, where the forests are, which isn't much of the country. But that's where the, the, the issues were, and that's where people were fighting. <coughs> And one of our tasks was to try and work out what to do with this very threatened possum, Leadbeater's possum. There down the bottom is the state of Victoria, which is a tiny state on the Australian continent, and they have only one endemic mammal, and that is Leadbeater's possum. So they're very, they're very precious about this little thing. The bad thing about this little mammal is it lives in the most productive Australian forests. In fact, it lives in the tallest flowering tree in the world, which is mountain ash, eucalyptus regnans. And these trees grow about one or two metres a year. 
uh, and they grow very fast on good soils and that's a rare thing in Australia. So they're used intensively for forestry and these possums prefer to nest in trees that are dead and old and well they're dead so they're four or five hundred years old or at least three hundred years old so they're not particularly compatible with clear fell forestry which is what a lot of the forestry in that area is in that small area. Uh, so our task was uh, the Victorian government basically and the state agencies came to us and said can you work out how we can save this species? What is a viable population? A very classical question that you get in those uh, periods of time and we've talked a little bit about what is viability and so that was our task. Um, we conducted what classically I would do from sitting in a maths department and David being an ecologist with lots and lots of data, a big population viability analysis. And this is what I did for several years uh, on lots and lots of species doing population viability analysis. And what's the problem with population viability analysis? The first thing is you've got to decide what is viable. What is a viable population? Well, actually, nobody knows the answer to that question. We've written a thousand papers on it and we have no idea. Um, and then I realised that when the Victorian government said to us, tell us what we have to do to our forest to make a viable population, well, science does not solve that problem. There's no, because A, if we said we need it to have a 99% chance of surviving a thousand years, you can never log again in this entire region, that wasn't going to work. And then they could easily say to us, why 90%, why a thousand years? Where's the science behind that? It's not, that's a, that's a, that's a value judgment. So ultimately, everything is trade-offs. Ultimately, everything's in trade-offs. And that whole literature in viability analyses is not a complete waste of time, but it's a, a sort of really theory that's going nowhere for practical purposes. So after doing all this work, I suddenly realised that in the end, we had all these economic and social constraints. And the task was to use the model to choose the best option that fitted those economic and social constraints. And so we basically looked at a range of options. We looked at things like increasing the rotation time, that is, instead of chopping the trees down when they're 80, maybe chopping them down when they're 120, or putting in small reserves. And the final conclusion we found within really all those social and economic constraints was that if you could, for, were willing to forgo maybe 10 or 15% of your timber production, the best thing to do was to put in small reserves and if the forest burns, don't do salvage logging. And that was economically viable, it was socially acceptable, the forest industry could persist and the possum had a, a better chance of persisting. I have no idea whether it's a viable population at all. In fact, that is not the question because you're not going to stop an entire industry that produces that much wood for one possum. So effectively, um, it was all about trade-offs, it was all about living in the social and economic constraints and of course all the biology fed in down the bottom. And that's when I learned that this is nothing to do, getting conservation outcomes is nothing to do with, well it's a little bit to do with biology but not much, about 10%. I think Eric showed us a diagram last year that was 10%. You know that's about how much it is biology. Um, this is um, uh, this is not a real letter, um, but effectively uh, this is a, another situation which is nice to be in. I was chair of the Australian Federal Government's Peak Biodiversity Advisory Committee for five years under Senator Hill and after various uh, uh, machinations with the public servants and the NGOs, we convinced uh, uh, them to do an inquiry into this issue and so we got what was John Howard's Prime Minister's Science en Engineering and Innovation Council to ask us to write a report. They do two reports every year on every issue in the country, two reports, and nanotechnology, gene technology, health, water, they'll be, we got one crack at biodiversity in the last decade and this was it. And Steve Morton was the chief of the CSIRO division and myself and we basically sat there and said how are we going to do this and how are we going to deliver these outcomes. So Steve had known that I'd been talking on and on about decision theory and he said, well, this is your chance, you've now got to do it, which is a bit painful because I was an academic and I didn't want to do anything, I just wanted to complain about other people not doing things. <laughs> you know, it's easy to criticise, it's very, very difficult to actually deliver the outcomes. And so we had to do it. Um, we had about nine months and we structured it in this way, which was very, very different from what government typically heard from scientists and conservationists. We basically said, 
um, we're going to give you a range of options that deliver the biggest bang for your buck. Now, bearing in mind this was our right-wing government, economic rationalist since the economic rationalism since the mid 90s is is the only way Australia is run. Regardless of whether we have a left-wing government or a right-wing government, ever think I think ever since I think Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the world is economically rational, and so. Basically, we said, we will tell you how to get the most species saved per unit dollar, but we're not going to say you need to give us $10 billion or $100 billion or $2 billion. We're just going to tell you what's the most effective, cost-effective thing to do. And in fact, it went down very well because they were sick of scientists and conservationists telling them they need to spend billions of dollars and everything's bad and you need a bigger park system because they always say you need a bigger park system, you need to spend more money, but they never knew when were they going to stop? And nor were they ever told what they would get for the more money or the bigger park system. So they'll be giving all these options, but they were never told exactly what would be the outcome. So we embarked on a bold process where we got about 30 experts together, the best sort of biodiversity and politically astute conservation brains in the country for three days. And I set them this task. I said, come up with a plan for saving biodiversity, a, a big project, and we're going to work out how much it costs, we're going to work out what's the chance it's successful, and we're also going to work out how many species in the long run you would save by doing that plan. And therefore we can calculate the species saved per million dollars. And for, for about a day they didn't like it, and they argued with me and said it was impossible. You can't do these things. For example, here's one of the, uh, we listed these options, we had to work out for example, if you stop land clearing in the state of Queensland and New South Wales, how many species would you save? We actually used mainly bird data and then converted the bird data. I mean, if land clearing is going to wipe out 15 bird species in eastern Australia, then for every bird in the world there's 10 plants, for every plant in the world there's 20 insects, and so you just multiply it up and you get 5,000 species. That's what you'd save, and land clearing destroys them all. Um, we worked out whether they're politically feasible and we looked at collateral benefits to look at trade-offs. And this is the kind of thing we came up with crudely and then Steve Morton and, and the CSIRO staff ground through the numbers and made it work. But effectively this was one of the strategies and this one actually came to fruition through the state government um, by about 2004. They stopped land clearing. They were clearing 500,000 hectares a year. That's 5,000 square kilometres every year was being cleared in Queensland until, not, until the mid until recently, in fact. Um, that was 15% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, <laughs> that process, if it continued on for another 40 or 50 years, we estimated it would cause, in the long run, over 5,000 species extinctions. We estimated it would cost $200 million to stop, and that was roughly right, because it cost actually slightly less to stop for compensation for farmers. And so then we found out that you can save 26, million, 26 species per million dollars. Now that's a bargain. It's got to be a bargain, doesn't it? How much, how much money have the British spent on, on bitterns, which isn't even a species endemic to Britain? Or how much did the Californians spend on Californian condors? Well, I think they got one species for about um, maybe $100 million, if that. We, we're getting... Um, uh, 26 species saved per million dollars. Of course, these are fungi and invertebrates as well. But in the end, the first time in their life, they'd actually been delivered a package and they'd be delivered a process where they could choose between a range of options that maximise the benefit. And they can spend $100 million or they can spend $100 billion. So they could still use these options and buy from those options. Of course, the scientists hated it initially. They said these are impossible to come up with these numbers. There's huge uncertainties. And in the end I said, well, if you walk out of this room, you're the expert on this particular issue. If you can't give me the number, I'm going to make them up when I go home. <laughs> and so, you know, an expert is only better than an idiot, really. And I was the idiot. And so they had to be the expert. And then there's other things. We went through about 30 of these options. This is actually not published. It's, it's a report on the internet. So technically it's not published. It's not even science. Uh, it's not peer reviewed. Uh, but it was heavily influential. And a lot of the things <laughs> that we found were very cost effective state and federal governments have done in the last uh, in the last five or six years but a lot of things for example as i say some are some are um are high value some are low value and we went through all these options and i can send you the link for the report if you like um, what are the lessons from that process 
I mean, all the science was expert opinion. We didn't rush around saying we need to spend 20 years doing more studies and doing a big report. We did it in nine months because we had a deadline. We had to turn up in front of Cabinet and present this to them. Um, the success was very much the packaging in the social and economic framework. They didn't want to know all the details. They didn't really care about whether these numbers were close or right. They were never <laughs> going to argue with them. They're all lawyers and accountants and economists. They're not scientists. Um, and really, by framing it in the right way, in fact, the other part of the document was a big discussion about how important biodiversity was, which is, again, not really science. It was all really about people's values. Uh, and, and the other final thing is uh, we used a very simple metric, cost effectiveness. Expected benefit divided by cost. Uh, it's exactly what uh, Liana and Belinda will talk about. It's not perfect, it's not wonderful, but the only thing you can say is I'm sure if I was standing here 3,000 years ago and I talked to somebody who was trading on the Phoenician coast, they could do it. They know how to do cost effectiveness. It's ha the way everybody shops. Okay? How many kilograms of flour per dollar? So we've, the, the uh, cost effectiveness is almost, almost in our genetic code. Um, it's so innate. And so it's not complicated. There's no complicated math. I can write down the formula that it's just shopping, smart shopping. That's all it is. So the science there was, was I know how to shop. Well, in fact, I don't know how to shop. But. And the final story I want to tell is a conservation planning story, which is about the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef. And this is, this is again, not a letter that exists, but it's roughly true. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, knew they had to rezone the Great Barrier Reef around about 2004 again, 2003-2004. Uh, they'd been collecting lots and lots of data. Now the Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park, which is roughly that area there, um, just off the bottom of the map is the cultural capital of the world, which is Brisbane, where I come from, um, <laughs> and if you like rugby, um, and off the, t off the top of the map is, is, is New Guinea. Uh, so that's about, I think, 2,000 kilometres of coastline and it's 200 or 300 kilometres wide. It's the, you know, a very iconic uh, thing for Australia. It's not the most diverse coral reef in the world, but 5,500 reefs, enormous diversity. It generates about $3 billion for the Australian economy every year in terms of tourism. And now, it was already a park and it was already managed by one authority, that was the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and at that time John Day was running this process. Uh, Grubrumpa, as I'll call them, they uh, had a mandate. They'd already conserved 5% of that area. So when we started, 5% was green zone. Those colours are actually different sort of eco-regions. 5% was green zone. They had tonnes of data, so they came to Bob and I and they knew that we were into conservation planning. They also were very aware that conservation planning had not really been done much in the sea. I mean, the world's marine park system is still, I think, under 1% of the surface of the ocean. So we have, a very, we have an abysmal marine park system on a global scale. So there wasn't much, really, marine conservation was very much put a marine ecologist in the ocean. They will find things that nobody's ever found before. They come up and say, that should be a marine park. That's about how we did it in the 1990s. So marine parks were very closely correlated to marine research stations. But they had lots of data. They had CDs of data, thousands of gigabytes of data all over the place. In fact, most of it was entirely useless because most of the data was not comprehensive. There was a bit of sponge data from here. There was some mollusk data from there. Most of it couldn't be used. You need comprehensive data for conservation planning because otherwise it's going to be biased and you're just going to go and buy the places that the marine ecologists are. <laughs> How have they done this incredible piece of work where they'd assembled all this data and created ecological regions, both for the reefs and not just the reefs, but the, the between reef areas. And effectively, the task was quite simple. They'd met for many years with the ecologists and come up with all these principles, and they come up with 10 principles of conservation planning, which were, they basically reinvented the entire world of, of terrestrial conservation planning. Those 10 principles were identical to the fundamental principles of terrestrial conservation <laughs> planning. They could be mapped on almost identically. They weren't, had never read the terrestrial literature. It was one of the worst things about marine and terrestrial sciences and spanning the, the areas is they don't talk to each other. Marine people, the temperate people, don't talk to the tropical people sometimes. So a lack of communication is rife. But anyway, they've done a good job of getting all the data sorted out 
it actually went very well in the end. Uh, they set a target of conserving 20% of everything, and everything is every colour on that map, plus a lot of data on turtles and dugongs and other things. So they said, we want 20% of everything. The, and the worst thing they didn't do is because the scientists had driven all the principles to that point. It was all driven by ecologists and, and, and public service ecologists and other ecologists. Nobody wanted to talk about economic and social consequences. So I said, our software, MarkSan, only works by trying to achieve your goals of getting 20% of everything for the minimum impact on everybody else. Because if you say, I want to get 20% of in everything, I can do that. That's very easy. Oh, I can make the whole thing a marine reserve if you like. I can just draw 20% so I get 20% of everything. But I'm more certainly going to draw a line over the most productive fishery in the area or where indigenous people fish or where the recreational fishing, the, you know, the uncle of one of the important politicians goes out on Sunday morning. That means you're not going to get your marine park system. You're not going to get your marine park system because you're going to piss people off. So what does Mark Sand do? Mark Sand says, give me 20% of everything and annoy as few people as possible. Just don't annoy them because otherwise this will not go through the political process. That's it. We have this big complicated piece of software. That's all it does. Annoy as few people as possible. Um, they, it took me two years to convince them to collect the social and economic data so we could run the software. And that was the one thing that was a tra tragedy. They just kept doing bi more biological analysis because they were biologists. Um, so it was easy. In the end it happened. The reserve system's in. This whole process is now going all around Australia. We will have a marine reserve system that covers an area the size, will, they will rezone an area the size of Australia and probably somewhere between 20, 15 and 30 percent will be conserved. So that's, we're talking about two million square kilometres of marine reserves could emerge following basically this process. It's been a very long and slow and painful process, but it's all happening and it's all being done by one piece of software and a federal government. And actually it's been done, driven really by a person who was our former environment minister, Senator Hill, who had the vision as early as 1996 that it was time to make a marine park system. So we had one politician who several of us had serious long chats to and said, this is your chance to make a mark on the world. This is your chance to change the face of the planet. And he has, unfortunately, he's not in office anymore as an environment minister, but he was the person who set it all going. So you've got to get to the politicians and convince them. Um, all that happened. Uh, in some senses you might say that sounds like a success story. There was, I'll tell you one bad story. When this process finished, the compensation package, which was buying out fishermen so because they'd lost areas they could fish in, largely commercial fishing, was expensive. It was $300 million. I think that was a good outcome because they could reorganise their lives and, and go on and, 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 and the fishing pressure was reduced. Um, it's a, it's $300 million is a small price for an asset that makes $3 billion to the Australian economy a year, so I think it was cheap. However, because of that, some of the people in the public service, the federal public service, decided this process was bad. And when they went to do the rezoning for the southeast of Australia, that's the area between Sydney, Adelaide, down to Hobart, another huge area, they refused to use any systematic planning processes. They refused to use them. Apparently I pissed a few, few of them off publicly and they wouldn't use MarkSan. They then commissioned other people to build the reserve system who then used MarkSan to build it, but they wouldn't tell them they were using it because <laughs> they, used, they weren't allowed to use it because I'd pissed them off. They delivered us a reserve system which was 8% of that region. Now that sounds great. 8% of the entire shelf in the southeast of Australia, half a percent of the shelf is conserved. Now anybody who knows anything about systematic conservation planning knows they were duped. The fishing and the coal, the fishing and the oil and gas industries beat them up and they only lost half a percent of what they could ever want, which is all the shelf. I mean, how much interest is in there in water that's 4,000? Now you need a lot of money to do this because you need to pay somebody full time to produce such stuff. You need somebody who can write well, which generally is not us. Write well meaning it has to be simple and it has to be clear. <coughs> I'll finish with one sort of comment about how do you, how do you ever get things done. Now we, we've written a paper about 
um, practical suge suggestions for getting researchers and policy makers and managers all wor working together. And we have all these politically correct, lovey-dovey sort of hand, hand holding ideas about how we're all going to be together in the same room and make decisions collectively. And they're good. They're good. <coughs> uh, you know, it's communication, workshops, sharing, people spending time in each other's places. It's basically about building relationships. And I think that's the critical thing. Where I've had success, I've built relationships. But there's one thing that's not in here, which they wouldn't let me put in here, and there's how do you get anybody to pay any attention to you whatsoever? So you, you know, I started this stuff 20 years ago when I was a little postdoc with no job and no lab and no career. What do you do? I throw stones. So I just sit there and I throw stones. I still throw stones. I violently criticise the government that gives me $1.7 million a year on a monthly basis. Because <clears throat> if you throw stones, they get sick of it and they say, come inside because somebody outside is throwing stones at us. Can you come inside? <coughs> and then a salute says, you turn up. As soon as they say, be, can you be on a committee? I currently sit on 17 different NGO and government committees. I always turn up because if you're not turning up, you're not part of the process. Somebody asks Salit, says, who makes, the, who makes decisions in the world? The people who turn up. That's it. If you think you're disempowered, just turn up. But first you throw the stones because you're going to get the invita invitation. And then the final thing is, when you're there, don't complain. Well, complain a bit, but don't complain too much. Give them solutions. You've got to actually tell them what they can do to make things right. You can't just tell them all the things they've done wrong in the past. So we've always had a very much a solutions-based approach. We, we may say the way you're doing is not perfect, but this is a better way of doing it. And so we're always about delivering solutions rather than criticising government just for the sake of it, although it is a lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs>